right, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get going. Uh, I'll try to keep this as efficient as possible. We'll, we'll aim for half an hour to give you guys uh, some of your time back. So thanks everyone for um, showing up today. I hope you're staying safe, staying healthy, wherever you are in the world. Uh, what we've been doing over the last handful of months is every Tuesday we take a closer look at one of the lower level components in the technology stack. Uh, we've done things such as oracles, um, private document stores, tokens, zero knowledge proofs, uh, command line exercisers, uh, pretty much everything that's available in Kaleido, uh, more of a kind of a developer focused uh, webinar on Tuesdays. And then on Wednesdays, we just look at the, the core building blocks of how to create your business network, create a blockchain, configure it, and then look at a few techniques to submit some basic transactions. Uh, as a heads up, I've, I've allowed everyone to talk, so uh, I'd ask that you just stay on mute if you don't have anything to say, but uh, please chime in. This can be as interactive uh, as we want it to be. Uh, happy to answer uh, any use case oriented questions, uh, business, technical, uh, pretty much anything's on board. So with that, I'll go ahead and share a few slides and then we'll go through the product and build a network and create a blockchain. So Kaleido at, at a very high level is defined by three core characteristics. We're built for modern business networks, so completely industry and use case agnostic. We have clients spanning capital markets, supply chain, government, energy, uh, you name it. The use case, the solution uh, can be built and be provisioned very, very easily on Kaleido. Uh, the second one is radical simplicity. Uh, and this extends not only at the blockchain layer and the network layer, making it very easy to build out your consortium, create blockchains, configure your blockchains, but also at the programmatic layer, whether it's interacting with smart contracts or interacting with the services that we have. Uh, there is a REST API behind every piece of functionality inside of Kaleido, whether it's an operator or a systems administrator, uh, or whether it's an actual smart contract or full stack developer. Uh, very, very easy to stitch together all of the components that you need. Uh, and then the last one, very much built for the enterprise. So four nines of uptime, high availability, disaster recovery, auto scaling, ISO 27,000 compliance, uh, and really, really powerful extensions on transaction signing, key encryption, uh, redundancy, data backups, business continuity, uh, you name it. We have all of the integrations and all the features um, available for you to leverage. Uh, and then a good number of them are baked in as first-class citizens inside of the platform. Our approach with Kaleido and, and with blockchain in general has really been to try to flatten the curve and allow people to, to quickly progress you know, from an idea, from an, you know, a, a concept, you know, from that POC phase all the way into production. And there's a lot of challenges along the way. Uh, first and foremost, just wrapping your head around this new technology with peer-to-peer -peer protocols, with smart contracts, uh, with new transaction, um, you know, interaction methodologies, uh, with all of this cryptography. Um, and then, you know, as you progress into a pilot, into a production, you need to very easily be able to decentralize your network, bring on participants, um, you know, allocate governance and permissioning. Uh, and then in production, you have, you know, this, this imperative need to, you know, be able to sustain high throughput, to be able to add more nodes, uh, remove members, add members, et cetera. Uh, know that the underlying infrastructure uh, is going to meet the needs of your business network, whether it's transaction or whether it's just participation. So one thing that's become uh, abundantly clear for us, and, and this is a you know, really core piece of Kaleido and what we've built is that the blockchain, the nodes, the smart contracts, the consensus algorithm, it's incredibly, incredibly important. But when you take a step back and you actually look at what goes into a full stack solution, you realize that there's you know, dozens and, and maybe even hundreds of components that need to be integrated, whether it's your you know, identity and access management systems, whether it's your data stores, uh, whether it's your key management systems, uh, oracles, et cetera. Um, all of these pieces need to be, you know, woven and, and integrated um, into your full stack architecture. Uh, and so at Kaleido, what we've done is we've tried to address the needs of what would be, you know, a proper bona fide full stack architecture 
with our Kaleido marketplace and provide enterprises, business networks, developers with all of the pluggable components that you need to kind of address this stack here. Moving from the bottom up, starting with data. Um, how do you take your private data stores? How do you integrate those into your blockchain solution? And then how do you start referencing some of that data on chain and sharing some of that data, whether it's on chain or whether it's off chain, whether it's a, kind of an intersection of both techniques. Uh, at the transaction layer, there's lots of different uh, network compositions. Some can be completely transparent and completely public, albeit still operating within an authenticated, permissioned private network. Um, but the transactions themselves and the underlying world state can be public. Um, however, there are a lot of use cases, supply chain, financial, just for a couple examples, where you need to have private transactions, where, for example, we may, we may need to you know, conceal the price uh, of an asset. Uh, so Kaleido provides you with multiple blockchain configurations with different node clients and different consensus algorithms so that you can perform private transactions. Um, those transactions are incredibly, incredibly important. Uh, and as important is the consumption of events that are happening on the blockchain. Uh, very rarely are you gonna have a single organization just driving transactions to the blockchain. As your network evolves, you're gonna have you know, a, a diverse set of participants and they're going to make transactions. They're going to add state into the blockchain. Uh, so you as a business, as an enterprise, you need to have some mechanism to reliably consume these state changes so that you need to know if, for example, if an asset is made available for purchase so that you can consume that logic in your back office processes and you can maybe even automate your own logic. So reliably consuming events, um, you know, the methods inside of a smart contract that you care about, really, really important. Uh, scooting a bit higher as we get closer to the application layer, this is where we need to answer questions around where our data comes from. Are, is it apps talking to each other or is it perhaps an Oracle service or is it an integration with our LDAP service or our Active Directory provider? Where is the data coming from? Where's our end user information? So we need all of these integrations, all of these connectors to our critical back office processes uh, and also to some ancillary on-chain processes like oracles, for example. And then at the top of the stack, the really, really fun layer, in my opinion, this is where we start dealing with um, these, these new digital asset paradigms, tokens to be precise, um, fungible and non-fungible tokens, uh, now having the ability to you know, model stable coins on the blockchain, now having the ability to take a real world asset like a car, like a building, like a piece of fine art, for example, um, and modeling that as a non-fungible token and even fractionalizing the ownership of that single asset. Uh, going hand in hand with tokens, there's some really, really fun, innovative, uh, bleeding edge cryptography um, innovations that have taken place, uh, specifically zero knowledge proofs. So Kaleido has an extension allowing you to take your fungible assets and do what we call darkroom trading, completely anonymous, confidential and private exchange of assets. Uh, and then move those back into a more visible public setting on your Kaleido chain. Uh, really, really nifty stuff. Uh, and then for me, the, the most important layer in the blockchain is kind of how do we get transactions into the network, right? We talked about the consumption of events, knowing about world state changes, but we need, we need some mechanism that allows, you know, all developers to have this, this common technique to submit transactions. They shouldn't have to learn you know, all about Ethereum, all about these new blockchain APIs. Instead, have some simple gateway, some simple abstraction of the Ethereum API, of the blockchain API in question, that allows them to use techniques that they're comfortable with, right? Basic web development, um, you know, restful submissions. Uh, and so this is a core piece of Kaleido that goes hand in hand with the events. Transactions coming in through the gateway, and events coming out through the gateway. And we'll take a pretty close look at that today. Uh, this is a, a critical, critical feature of Kaleido that allows projects to really, really get that velocity. Uh, you're not caught up with you know, building out that, that server-side logic where you need all of those pretty esoteric and, and pretty complicated 
uh, Ethereum APIs. Instead, you can just use basic JSON payloads and basic REST calls. And Kaleido will actually do all of the heavy lifting for you, uh, the signing and the submission of those transactions. Um, so as I mentioned, Kaleido littered with APIs in a good way, um, you know, both at the administrative level, at the blockchain level, and at the services level. Uh, tons of services that help you build out your solution, whether it's data, whether it's events, whether it's connectors. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, you don't have to focus on the blockchain layer at the runtime layer, even at the, you know, the transaction submission layer. You can focus on the business logic, what you want your smart contract to do. And more importantly, you can focus on the user experience and the interface that your end users and your customers are going to leverage so that they have a delightful experience and potentially they don't even know that blockchain is there behind the scenes, right? Kaleido is this server so far down the road that they're not even concerned with. They just know that this is an interface that they can use to query data, to transact data, uh, and to see their assets. So super high level bullet points of just what Kaleido lets you do. Create instant networks. Uh, literally in about 30 seconds, you can create a consortium and create your own bespoke configurable blockchain. Great services around tokenization, whether it's fungible or non-fungible, or whether it's even swapping those assets um, using you know, a piece of software, an escrow smart contract instead of an intermediary. Uh, Cross-cloud, borderless, and even on-premise deployment orchestrations are available. So you don't have this binary decision of, we have to run on AWS or we have to run on Azure. You can have this diverse business network where companies and organizations can maintain their existing investments, their existing cloud estates, and they can all communicate in Kaleido, leveraging and integrating the services that already exist in those cloud estates. Very easy to decentralize the network. Everyone can have autonomous unilateral ownership of their resources. Uh, and then you can structure the network with governance and permissions uh, as you see fit, allowing certain organizations to maybe have admin root level permissions and others to have a more tempered level you know, of, of administrative ownership. Uh, lastly, uh, I alluded to the marketplace and we'll look at some of those services, but these are the plug and play services that we have to address the needs of a full stack uh, you know, solution. And then lastly, some fantastic bleeding edge innovations, zero knowledge proofs, tethering to the main net, uh, and smart contract management, which we'll also look at today. Um, Touch on this at the beginning, but but one thing that's really important to hammer home is that you know Kaleido truly is enterprise grade, right? With the four nines of uptime, with ISO certification, with SLAs, with 24/7 support, HA, DR, auto scaling, critical cloud integrations for business continuity, for key management, for private data traffic. Uh, and then our team itself is um, structured with not only blockchain networks, but also you know, industry specific experts and cloud architects and, and cloud computing experts as well. Um, so we're running you know, best of breed open source technologies with Geth, Quorum, Hyperledger, Besu, and those accompanying algorithms, um, but also some, some really powerful you know, open source utilities like Chainlink, for example. Um, so Kaleido gives you all of this out of the box and you have the ability to leverage any of these integrations, any of these services, you know, as your use case, as your project um, kind of expands from POC to pilot to production. Quick snapshot of, you know, the, the diverse nature of enterprises and customers on Kaleido. And we see here that, you know, it spans all the way from, you know, finance institutions to energy majors, uh, to major brands and realtors and, you know, some municipalities and government organizations. So truly, truly use case and industry agnostic. Uh, it's just about, uh, you know, what data are we putting on the chain? What problems, what sources of friction are we trying to remove in our existing business processes? Uh, and, and what kind of network, what kind of composition do we need here? So just a few high level use cases of what's going on. Covantis and Comgo, uh, two very, very large consortia working in the trade finance space with letters of credit and post-trade settlement. Uh, Union Bank in the Philippines tokenizing their fiat currency so that they can allow rural banks to have access to their central banking network. 
These are these remote islands that don't have sophisticated hardware and infrastructure, aren't connected to the SWIFT network, but using Kaleido, using tokenization, using blockchain, they can exchange um, these assets and they can do remittances to these very, very far rural islands without the need to dilute those assets through pawn shops, through intermediaries. Uh, Green Fence Consumer, working with some major brands and retailers and movie studios on um, coupons and non-fungible, provably scarce digital collectibles, uh, and then a handful of others. World Wildlife Fund using token curated registries uh, and Atato doing supply chain. Uh, last thing to touch on, um, as I mentioned, you know, our, our goal is to really flatten that curve from POC, from pilot into production. Uh, and we either have a tier, starter tier, team tier, business or enterprise with a sort of a SaaS pay-as-you-go model that accompanies that stage of the journey. But we also have packages. We also have, you know, bespoke contracts that we can create um, for business networks or for individual organizations to give you access to the resources that you need at a price point that you need um, to keep that velocity for your project. So I'll close out of this and then we'll go ahead and build, uh, build out a network. I'm going to pause for a second because I see a few questions in the chat. Okay, so, so the question, I don't know if everyone can see the chat, but the question is, is it for public or private blockchains? So Kaleido by nature is for permissioned, authenticated, um, private or consortium based blockchains. So every organization uh, needs to be invited um, and they are identified by a membership, nodes, security credentials and services are all bound to a membership. Um, what we have is we have the ability to run your resources, have those pods, have those containers running on AWS or running on Microsoft Azure or through a closed program that we have, use Kaleido private stack and actually um, have those runtimes existing in your own private cloud or in your on-premise data center. And then the second question is what resource support is available for startups in terms of identifying the libraries, tools, for our use cases. Yeah, well, I think it's uh, terribly dependent on the use case, right? What industry are you in, right? What problems are you trying to tackle? What sources of friction um, and, and issues do you have at the moment within your use case? And, and this is, um, or within your industry, excuse me. And, and Satya, this is something I'm more than happy to, you know, take offline and, and we can discuss further. Um, but the, the true answer is it, it really just depends, right? No, no network is identical to another network. You know, industry is identical to another industry, but we do see a lot of techniques and a lot of components that are recyclable through these use cases. So th thanks for those questions. And I see we have a couple more folks that joined, so I'm just gonna unmute everyone here. Um, cool. So we'll go into Kaleido. Um, one, one really nifty thing, and, and we showed this a bit last week, but uh, we've now released version two of the Kaleido console so um, a, a really next generation interface for you know, visualizing all of the functionality on Kaleido uh, and just having a better understanding of the relationships between services, between runtimes, um, and between participants that are in your business network. So not all of the functionality that is on what I'll call classic Kaleido is available um, on version two of Kaleido. So for this, I'm gonna just kind of hop back and forth so that we touch on the core concepts. Uh, but what I've already done is I've already created an example network um, and I'll use that when we actually send some transactions. But I'll take you guys through the flow of how it would work if you're just coming in cold, creating your first network or consortium as we call it, uh, and then ultimately creating an environment and standing up a few nodes. So the first call to action is to create your consortium or create your business network. So we can call this the, we'll call it the Wednesday consortium. And then if this was supply chain, if this was capital markets, if this was, you know, pharmaceutical tracking, you could choose to upload a mission statement or some legalese. Um, this is, you know, completely voluntary here, uh, not, not a required parameter. So just give a name to your network, click next, and then choose the home region. Um, this is just going to store the membership details of your network. 
but it's also going to be a whitelisted cloud provider and a whitelisted region, meaning that when we create our environment and we subsequently create nodes and services, this cloud and this region is going to be whitelisted. It's going to be available um, to host those runtimes. So we see we have four in AWS and we have a single one in Azure. Um, and, and if you have requirements, you know, to have different data centers, you know, in Paris, for example, with Microsoft Azure, this is something that we can very, very easily um, add to the platform in a conversation we're, we're happy to have offline um, based on your requirements or your client's requirements as well. So I'll go with AWS um, in US, click next. Uh, and now you have the ability to create this hybrid or, or this you know, additionally decentralized um, multi-border, multi-cloud network, bringing on additional regions in AWS and Europe or APAC, uh, or even bringing on an additional cloud provider so that you can really accommodate these diverse um, uh, decentralized networks. And this, uh, this is not a binary choice at this point. You can go back in time um, and add additional cloud providers uh, as your network requires. So go ahead and click finish. Uh, and now you've created the baseline, the, the scaffolding for your network, for your consortium. Um, and you can build it out in one of two ways. You can create multiple memberships. Um, this could be for mocking out the participation of the network or it could be for a scenario where you're going to proxy operate resources on behalf of an end user, uh, which is actually more common than, than you may believe. Um, there's, there's a lot of scenarios and a lot of use cases where organizations want the promise and, and they want the, the utility of blockchain, but they don't want the overhead. They don't want the administrative burden of having to actually operate those nodes, uh, albeit Kaleido is handling the managed runtime of those, but there's still, at the end of the day, there's an owner of those resources. Um, so this proxy operated model is common, um, as is mocking out, you know, the overall composition of your network before you choose to onboard participants. Um, so you have this memberships tab right here, this feature, and, you know, I'm organization ABC, so I have the first membership, and now I can just add members or add users to my organization. So I could create you know, organization XYZ, as I often do. And now this will be available, you know, to bind to nodes, bind to credentials, bind to services. Uh, and again, this is either mocking out how your network will look, or it's you saying, all right, I'm going to proxy operate resources on behalf of this end user. So that's route number one. Uh, route number two is to actually decentralize your network and bring on external participants, uh, autonomous organizations. So that feature is not available yet in um, V2 of Kaleido. So what we'll do is we'll go to the, the classic Kaleido uh, and I'll show you this feature. Uh, and it's terribly, terribly easy to use, um, either programmatically via one of our APIs or in the dropdown uh, service here, just click invite organization. And now you can extend an email invitation to you know, another participant in your business network to actually join this. So whoever the system administrator would be, I could type, <laughs> send off an email to them. And now yourselves, as the initiator, as the founder of this network, you can choose to extend some of the permissions that you have, or you can rescind and kind of temper the permissions for this organization. And there's five important permissions. Uh, they should all be fairly intuitive and fairly self-explanatory, um, but I'll, I'll sprint through them. Do they have the ability to create nodes that will participate in the consensus algorithm? Or do they just want to replicate the ledger, right? Maybe an auditor doesn't need to be voting on blocks and signing blocks, but they want to have, you know, line of sight into the network. So they might not need a signing node. The ability to manage environments. Uh, inside of Kaleido, you can have many environments in your business network, which is quite useful for, you know, proper DevOps pipelines of development, staging, pre-prod, production. Uh, so this is a critical permission here. Um, do you want this organization to be able to extend subsequent invitations? Uh, a rather critical one as well. Um, and then the last two, I showed you what it looks like to create multiple memberships, whether for mocking or whether for proxy op. Uh, and then lastly, the ability to manage smart contracts. Uh, and we'll take a pretty close look at this today. This is a fantastic feature. Um, and the way this works is it's just nested and it's hierarchical. So if this, per this invitation went out, 
and this organization accepted, they would be able to extend these four permissions, but they couldn't extend the membership's permission. So really easy to wrap your head around. Click button simple, email based, um, and can also be automated uh, via an admin API. So send that invitation out and that admin can inspect the current state of the network, see who's already on it, see the permissions, and they can you know, accept or decline accordingly. Uh, and, and typically, you know, that, that invitation, that's just semantics, right? That negotiation and those permissions, those are gonna be structured out of band and in, a, in an agreement is already gonna be reached. Um, almost certainly that's, that's the case that, you know, a proper network will follow here. Um, nonetheless, it's very easy to extend that invitation. Uh, last thing I want to touch on is just identity here, uh, specifically PKI-based enterprise identity. Um, so you have these organizations and you have these memberships, but for know your customer requirements, anti-money laundering, uh, and just unequivocal identification of, of who an organization claims to be, um, we allow you to underpin your memberships with digital certificates, with X509 certificates, um, that are common in every client server authentication, uh, every handshake. Um, so this allows the rest of the network to download your certificate and see that if you claim to be, you know, Bank of America, for example, that your certificate has been signed by some trusted CA out there, um, you know, basically asserting that you are who you claim to be. And, and we take this many, many steps further allowing you to bind those certificates with end user addresses and using them as the kind of the, the parent modules for asymmetric encryption and a lot of the sign verify logic that exists in our services. So I won't go ad nauseum on those, but uh, if you're interested, I'd, I'd encourage you to tune into one of the upcoming Tuesday talks where we'll go through kind of, you know, creating a public private key pair, um, forming a, what we call a certificate signing request, uh, and actually getting you know, our, our certificate assembled and signed by a private key. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting if, if you're new to kind of the whole PKI world, but um, today is not for that. So there's the baseline scaffolding for our business network. Um, and now we'll start doing the fun stuff. We'll actually create an environment. We'll start doing some transactions. So here I, I see all of my business networks, all of my consortia. And here we see our Wednesday consortium that I just created two memberships and two enabled regions. So we're gonna view the network and now we're gonna create an environment. And again, you can have multiple environments within a business network, within a consortium, and every node, every security credential, um, every service is firewalled and confined to that network. So let me just click extend the session. So we'll call this guy development, for example, okay? And now we can choose to make it a single region um, orchestration using any of our whitelisted clouds and regions, or we can make it a multi-region environment, meaning when we create a node, I'll have AWS and I'll have Azure available. Click next. Now you need to configure your environment. So when we were looking at that full stack uh, picture earlier, we started talking about transaction privacy. This is where you have different node clients that can accommodate private transactions. They, use, uh, they actually use a private um, Merkle state tree um, to hold the state of private transactions. Uh, and every participant that's non-privy to those uh, just has a hash, an indecipherable hash or a pointer to that transaction. They don't actually execute it and update their state. Uh, so geth is the Go implementation of Ethereum, battle hardened on the mainnet. Uh, we use proof of authority rather than proof of work, right? We're in a private network so we can use voting and digital signatures very efficient algorithms that support high throughput. Uh, but then you have Quorum and Basu, like I said, that support these private transactions and they come with different algorithms. Um, they have Raft and Istanbul BFT, uh, and then Basu has proof of authority in Istanbul BFT. Uh, just for folks on the call, uh, the, the most common orchestration that we see um, across decentralized networks and across enterprises at this point in time is Quorum and IBFT. Uh, so Quorum was a fork of Geth donated by JP Morgan um, that, that has a, a pretty, uh, pretty good following in the open source community. Um, we have protocol engineers that commit upstream to it, um, but it's just been out there for the longest time and has the most users. Uh, and IBFT is definitely the strongest of the three algorithms in terms of voting rounds and in terms of the number of signatures that you're going to get on a block. So 
just, just for everyone's edification. Okay, so click finish, and that creates the genesis block for your environment that bootstraps it. Uh, what we want to do now is we want to actually bring it to life by adding some nodes. And again, this is very, very easy to do, and this is also automatable um, via some utilities we have or simply via um, our administrative APIs. So we can call this node number one. We're going to bind it to organization ABC, and then we choose where we want to deploy it, AWS or Azure. Click Next. There's a bunch of cloud integrations that you can weave into your node. Uh, I'm not going to get into these today. You can read the docs or you can look back at one of the you know, the other Tuesday webinars where we talked about these, but again, should be self-explanatory. You know, add additional encryption with key stores, um, add backups for redundancy and business continuity, uh, take your logs and build out your own dashboards, uh, or do private networking. And then lastly, choose the footprint that you need for your node. Um, so based off of, you know, the amount of mining that might need to take place in your network, uh, the number of, you know, concurrent connections for a horizontally scaled app, uh, and just the throughput that you're going to need. Um, there's small, medium, and, and large t-shirt sizes. Um, and, you know, there's links to docs and all these steps to help you learn more and decide um, sort of what the right size is for you. Uh, we also have some testing utilities where you can really, really clearly identify, if, you know, the, the current size of your node is incompatible with sort of the, the architecture of your solution. Choose if it's a signer, click finish, and you're good. Uh, and again, I'll reiterate that this is all automatable and accomplishable via the API. So I'll go back and I'm going to create um, one more node. Because we use proof of authority, we want to have an odd number of nodes. So Kaleido always gives you a free node, a free validator called the system monitor, which does the indexing and allows for all of the rich functionality uh, in, the, in the block explorer. Um, and plays a big role in a lot of the other services as well. Um, so you get one out of the box, uh, and then based on the algorithm that you've chosen, uh, there is a recommended number of nodes. Odd number for proof of authority. You want at least four total for IBFT, um, and so on. So click Next, and I'll make this guy a small node as well, too. So these guys will take a few moments to initialize here. Um, and while they're coming up, what we're going to do is we're going to create a smart contract project. Um, actually, before they come up, let me hop back to the old console. And I'll show you guys a few um, transaction techniques here that are available. Um, so this guy's coming up. I'm going to go ahead and just use um, the existing consortium that I've already built. Okay, so I called this one development as well, um, and we have our nodes here. So there's two routes to talk to an Ethereum blockchain. Uh, the classic route over JSON RPC uh, makes use of what we call a, a client library, right? Um, um, SDK, uh, something that can translate, you know, basic APIs into the low-level protocol that can be consumed and, um, you know, shared by the blockchain network by its protocol. Um, so we give you a lot of ways to. Um, leverage those libraries and those SDKs uh, if that's your cup of tea. So what I've done here is I've just clicked on node number one. I see all of the low-level endpoints and identifiers, uh, and then I see this box here that says connect to the node. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click on that, and we see that we have two doors that we can go through. We can go through our classic door, native JSON RPC, which uses Web3 libraries, which uses frameworks like Truffle, uh, and then we have our REST API gateway, which I'll go ahead and show you guys that in the version two of the console. So as one approach, um, using classic web three, as the community calls it, um, is, is to use this JSON RPC layer right here. Um, with Kaleido, uh, I should mention this, every endpoint, whether it's a node, whether it's an admin operation, whether it's a service, um, accessing any endpoint is protected with boundary security. So admin operations have a bearer token, um, services and nodes use what we call app credentials, strongly generated credentials that are not stored by Kaleido uh, that allow us to authenticate and verify calls coming in. So you as an operator, you as an end user, you are responsible for the custody of these credentials, um, whether it's just saving them and persisting them, whether it's deleting them, or whether it's cycling them. A lot of different techniques to kind of securely manage your credentials. 
Um, but what I just want to show you is that uh, we have a, a rich set of examples and um, code snippets here that can help you understand the syntax and the authentication flows for these different libraries. So a very, very popular one, excuse me, out in the wild is uh, called Web3 JavaScript. Um, this is, uh, you know, for, for Node.js developers, this, this tends to be, you know, the, the out of the box choice. So what we give you here is we give you just, you know, basic little programs that'll go ahead and retrieve the latest block on your blockchain. Um, but importantly, it shows you how to authenticate, right? How to use that basic auth um, and the provider API. So you can literally just copy this program right here. We have public GitHub repositories that, you know, walk you through how to do this, that you can just clone. We'll tell you exactly, you know, what endpoints you need to replace, if, if, if any at all. Um, and then you can just experiment with these programs. So inside of here, uh, the actual driver, right, that code lives inside of index.js. So I'll just remove that. We'll create a new one. And I'll just paste that code that I copied on my clipboard, which I forgot to copy. There we go. Okay, um, and again, this is just going to retrieve the most recent block on our permissioned, you know, environment that we've created, uh, and it's going to authenticate to that node using those basic authentication application credentials. So just drive your program. Uh, you'll need node. You'll need npm installed. Uh, when this executes, this will go ahead and return us in the terminal the most recent block on the chain, which is six six eight. Um, so these are useful. Truffle is fantastic for doing user tests for, you know, testing the compilation of your code. Um, but they do require some familiarity, you know, with some lower level APIs and with some Web3 programming. Uh, the alternate route that Kaleido has given you through our REST API gateway um, is a, a much easier um, sort of transactional paradigm. So to give you a picture of kind of what it looks like, this entire piece of middleware, this shim right here, is what we call ETH Connect. And this is an abstraction of that JSON RPC API. And it removes the need to use those APIs, like that HTT provider API, for instance. Um, but when you're dealing with Ethereum and when you're signing transactions externally, uh, there's a lot of nuances that come into play, right? Just forming those objects properly with hexadecimal, with ROP encoding, um, but, but specifically something that's often a gotcha is the sequencing and the ordering of the transactions, referred to as nonce management. Uh, so what this whole layer does, this whole service, the REST API gateway, it takes that off the table. All you have to do as a business network, um, as a user, is upload a smart contract, some solidity, and Kaleido is going to give you REST endpoints for every method inside of that. Now at the application layer, instead of using an SDK, instead of using Web3 JavaScript or one of those client libraries, all you have to do is point to the method that, that's in question that you're interested in, supply some JSON for the argument, uh, and this layer is gonna take care of the rest. It's gonna sign the transaction in one of many, many ways, lots of ways to do this, whether it's cloud HSM signing, whether it's having accounts on the nodes, whether it's an HD wallet or a Kaleido managed wallet. Um, but the point is that it's going to assemble that object and it's going to deliver it reliably into your network. And it's also backed by Kafka, so it can consume uh, sudden bursts and surges of transactions uh, and it's not going to discard them. You're not going to get queued transactions. You're not going to get lost transactions. Right? So just a very, very simple um, kind of piece of middleware transaction layer uh, to submit transactions. Uh, we're not going to look at this today, sorry, um, but kind of moving in, in the other direction from this um, is the ability to take those events out of the blockchain. So we talked about how important it was, you know, when you have a decentralized network to have this real-time immediate notification of any pertinent transaction that's taking place on the network and so moving in the opposite direction via our REST API gateway, you can just tell Kaleido where you want events delivered. And that Kafka tier basically is just going to send you the JSON payloads for the events that are defined in the smart contract. And then you can, from there, build out your own rich query layer. Uh, you can integrate these you know, with your application. Um, use that data as you see fit. Uh, but the beautiful thing is you don't have to go to the blockchain to retrieve that data. It's going to come to you automatically. Okay, 
So back in version two of the console, we'll go to our Wednesday consortium network, click view the network. We see that we have our environment that we call development right here. It's up and running. We have our two nodes, XYZ's node, ABC's node, and we have our system monitor node. What we want to do is we want to create a shared asset. We want to create a smart contract project at the business network layer, at the consortium layer. And this is going to allow us to build out those RESTful endpoints and use this REST API gateway functionality. So we're going to create a contract project. I'm going to call it simple storage, which is a very easy solidity uh, piece of solidity logic to wrap your head around, uh, especially if you're new to blockchain and new to Ethereum. Uh, and then you tell Kaleido where the source is coming from. Are you going to compile it and provide Kaleido with the bytecode in the interface? Or do you want Kaleido to do that heavy lifting for you? Um, and if you elect for this route, you can just, you know, import it from a public or a private uh, GitHub repository. So I'll take you through the GitHub route. So here we have a contract project. Uh, these are just high level details, metadata about the project. We haven't done anything interesting yet. Um, but what we want to do is we want to create a new compilation inside of this project. So this is where we're going to point to a GitHub URL where that source code lives. So I'm going to call this V1 simple storage. And now I need to give the path to the dot .sol to the solidity file. Uh, and I realized that I lied when I said that I would do this in half an hour. So apologies. So we have a public JavaScript repository here. Um, great for, you know, if you want to get familiar with Web3 and do some more sophisticated stuff, uh, this is a really good starting point. Um, but inside of here is um, just a really nice smart contract with an event defined in it as well um, called simple storage. Um, so super quickly, it has one variable. Uh, it needs an argument passed to the constructor when we deploy it. It's an unsigned integer. Uh, and then it has two methods. It has a set and a git. And then a redundant method, which is query, which does the exact same thing as git. Um, okay, so what we want is we want the path to this. So copy that guy, and I'm going to speed up now because I want to show you guys one final thing at the end. Uh, so we're going to just click finish, and this is going to use a little serverless function, uh, AWS Lambda, and this is going to compile that source, give us the bytecode, give us the ABI, and give us any developer docs um, if those were included inside of the solidity. Shouldn't take more than five to ten seconds to do this. And it'll probably take 10 since I jinxed myself. Okay, going, going a little slower than normal today, um, but that's okay. Again, this is, this is still kind of, you know, the, the first stages of, of version two here. Um, let's go ahead and give it a refresh because that should have actually compiled by now. Um, okay, so still a few little, you know, gotchas that exist, you know, inside of sort of the, the interactive console here, but the APIs are clean behind the scenes and uh, all the functionality uh, is going to work the same. So that guy worked and I would actually venture to say it probably did work in four to five seconds. Uh, we just didn't get that, that real time notification. Um, okay, so here we see where the source code came from. We even see the git commit hash and we see the soul C version. Um, but what we want to do now is we want to basically promote this and we want to expose those APIs, those, those RESTful methods in the smart contract. So I'll call this simple storage. And all this is, is this is a definition of that compilation. It's an open API definition of that source code. Uh, the idea here, uh, <laughs> again, I'll try to speed up. The idea is that inside of a contract project, uh, you'll typically have multiple compilations, right? You'll iterate on your source code. You'll try to you know, create a new method, new loop, uh, and it won't compile, right? Uh, so then you need to create another compilation and another compilation and make sure this source code functions in conjunction with your app uh, and that you can harden your business logic. So the idea is create all of your compilations inside of a project, promote those to a development or a sandbox environment, make sure the behavior is as expected, and then you can take the exact same definition of that compilation, your gateway API, and you can promote that into your production. Uh, nothing will change at the app layer. Uh, all you have to do is just update the endpoint of where you're pointing it, right? Because you're in a different environment. So the security credentials will change. Um, some of the resource IDs will change. Okay, so here's our gateway API. Uh, we see where it came from. Uh, and now we can just view that API. So choose what lens you want to view it through, which node. 
Uh, and this is really nice because every node in the environment is made aware of this API. So everyone's going to be able to seamlessly interact with the same smart contract instance. Um, okay, so here's all the methods that we just looked at, get, query, set, uh, and then we have our root post method. I'm going to just use the default Ethereum account on node number one, but with this approach, and when we're looking at that REST API gateway picture, this is where we could choose to use an account that's in an HSM, or that's in an HD wallet, or that's in a Kaleido managed wallet, right? All of those are enumerated in this KLD from parameter right here. Choose if we want to submit it synchronously, meaning we're going to wait for the transaction to get executed and for the receipt to be returned. Um, we can also submit this asynchronously if we say false, which will just be an acknowledgement from Kafka. I'll leave this as true so we can see the fun transaction receipt. Uh, and then we can actually even give a, a human readable name to the smart contract. Instead of dealing with hexadecimal, we can give this um, something that's intuitive, something that's friendly to the whole network. So just say one, two, three, click try. And again, I'm doing this in, in the Swagger console, but this would always be done programmatically, right? With a Node program, with a Java, Python program, et cetera. Uh, so that came through. And now we're going to have an instance of this gateway API. So we have a gateway that we named simple storage, which again, it's a definition of those methods. And now we're going to have an actual deployed instance of that API gateway, which we see right here. Instances, simple storage, one, two, three, that we can now choose to uh, interact with, uh, whether we want to do just a basic query, whether we want to update the state, etc. So if we call git, it's going to give us back one, two, three, obviously. Okay, so very, very easy to um, basically just wrap your heads around, you know, what goes into a smart contract and then how can we very easily interact with the smart contract? How can we take our existing key value pairs our existing data, whether it's a hash of that data, whether it's you know a plain text JSON object, and submit that into the blockchain without having to use you know like I said esoteric complicated APIs. Uh, I'll just go ahead and update the state here super quickly, uh, and we'll take a quick look at the block explorer. So it needs to be under a hundred inside of the source code. I don't know if anyone looked really closely. So this is going to give us two transactions total inside of our network. The first one was the deployment of our smart contract, and the second one is us updating the state. Um, so if we close this, and we actually go to our data explorer view right now, we're going to be able to hop into the block explorer, and we'll be able to see some information about those transactions. Okay, so we see our blocks, and we see our transactions. So we see our first one, which was the deployment of our smart contract, and now we see the second transaction. We can very easily see which organization, which account it came from, and which smart contract or which API gateway it was called. So if we click on this guy, we're going to see all that information. But even more importantly, we get to see the method that was called inside of the smart contract and the argument that was passed to it. So this is fantastic for you know transparent oversight, for auditing, um, for just you know low-level um, granular inspection of your blockchain. Uh, and there's a lot of additional bells and whistles for monitoring, you know, looking at the performance, um, you know, of your environment or of even, you know, specific nodes, right? You can click on a node and you can dig, you know, as deep as you want into the run times, um, into the, basically the health and monitoring and metrics of that node. So if we click on our run times right here, we see our system monitor, we see node number one and node number two. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to show, I showed this yesterday, but it's, it's a pretty cool feature and um, it's, it's good to really, you know, help wrap your head around kind of the, the throughput and the functionality that you might need um, inside of your business network um, is this, this client driver, this, um, this library we have called Kaleido Go, uh, which is going to allow you to flood your network, you know, with, you know, as many transactions as you want. It'll let you mimic, you know, a horizontally scaled architecture with a bunch of workers and, you know, as many loops as you want. Um, so what I will do, let me make sure I'm in the right network. Okay, so I want to use my first network that I created to do this. So inside of my environment here in my example network, I have two nodes uh, similar to what we just did. Um, and what I want to do is I want to go ahead and get the fully qualified endpoint for my node right there. All right, I want to use this JSON RPC endpoint uh, and I want to use it with um, application credentials as well. 
So I want to reuse an existing application credential and I want to have um, I want to have the fully qualified endpoint. So to do this, I'm going to I'm going to go back to the actual old console to do this. Um, I'm still wrapping my head around uh, all of the nuances of, of new version two of Collido as well. So in the same boat as everyone else. So what I'm after is this. Uh, I just didn't want to do the heavy lifting of having to put in line those those application or those security credentials there. Um, so we're going to use this guy right here and we're gonna exercise our Kaleido Go program. So what we wanna say is, so I'll show you guys this repository actually for some context here. Um, but basically this is also gonna use uh, simple storage um, inside of just a little examples uh, directory that we have here. Uh, and then it comes with a bunch of tunable parameters that you have you know, to specify the accounts that you want to use on the node, uh, to specify the number of loops that you want, the number of workers that you want, uh, and even the number of transactions that you want. So uh, good that I pulled this up because I forgot to do uh, one important thing, which is to create multiple accounts on this node. So inside of the wallet right here, we're just going to add a bunch of additional accounts. I'm just going to do five clients or five workers, uh, and each of them will need a unique account to sign with. And I see that there's a question in the chat, so I'll try to multitask. Can you touch on IPFS? Yes, of course. Uh, the question was, can we can we learn some more about IPFS and zero knowledge proofs and where there's samples for that? Uh, yes, we can absolutely do that. Okay, so I have my five accounts right here. Uh, I have my uh, URL, uh, hopefully still copied on my clipboard. Uh, and now we just need to sort of drive the program. So dot slash Kaleido go, we need to give it um, where the source code is. So examples, simple storage, and now we need to use those parameters. So first we're gonna say, once we deploy this smart contract, uh, I want you to use a method inside of it. So it has a set method, and then what's the argument that we wanna pass to it? We'll just say one, two, three, four, five. How many workers do I want? I want five workers. How many transactions do I want per worker? I want five. How many loops do I want? Maybe I just want two. Uh, what is the endpoint for my node? That is what is hopefully on my clipboard right here, which it is. Uh, and then I need to give it all the accounts. Um, so those five accounts that I just created right here. So copy that, paste this. So again, this is really just a utility to help you guys realize, you know, Am I okay with you know small size nodes, um, or do I need medium? Do I need large nodes um, in order to you know accommodate uh, a rather horizontally scaled uh, application architecture? And if if you do have you know nodes that can't sustain these connections and this throughput, uh, you'll basically just see 429 errors that are thrown by the server side by Collido. Okay, so there's my five accounts. There is my node. Here are my arguments. Uh, I think this is good. We'll just go ahead and give this a go and we'll see if it works. Okay, so it looks like the contract was compiled and it was sent. That's good. Using our first worker. And now it's submitted um, an additional 25 transactions for each of our workers. And then it's going to go through another loop and try to do all of this again. So we should see 50 total at the end. Well, actually 51, if we're being honest, because we have a, we have a contract deployment and then we have 50 invocations of that contract. So these all came through, this is good. Um, and obviously the, the idea here is just to, to tune these parameters based on your use case, right? Uh, do we have a crazy horizontally scaled application where we might wanna have 15 or 25 workers? Uh, how quickly are transactions coming in? Uh, and what is sort of the, um, the congestion of the load, right? How many loops do we want to sort of um, try to layer into the chain? Uh, but the cool thing here is that now we can hop back to Collider v2 and we can sort of look at, you know, some of this really cool, you know, monitoring metrics and, and we can start to see interesting information around memory, around disk, around CPU. Um, and at the, um, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, at this level, at the health and monitoring level, we can see more interesting information for the run times, uh, and we can see more interesting information um, for our overall environment. Uh, and these views allow you to toggle and allow you to switch, you know, between the system monitor, between certain nodes, uh, so that you can granularly create a, a subset, um, your own bespoke view of the runtimes in question. Um, so that's it's just a useful program, Kaleido Go. Uh, it's in github.kaleido.io. Uh, it is public, and that's where the Web3 JavaScript library is, and a handful of others as well. Um, so the question, da 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 da. Let me make sure I had this up here. Yeah. Uh, towards the end, can you touch upon IPFS, CKP, utilities, and a sample and where we can see some tutorials? Yeah, so our docs are probably the, the greatest, um, you know, source of knowledge. Um, Kaleido Blockchain also has a YouTube channel. Um, so I've, I've actually taken folks through um, a bunch of examples, you know, using zero knowledge proofs, using IPFS, using Chainlink, et cetera. Uh, so that's a, that's a great place to start, just YouTube and search Kaleido Blockchain, um, but also the Kaleido docs as well. Um, so if you just go in here, um, you can, you know, ex expand, you know, into our third party services. Here we see our zero knowledge tokens with, you know, a walkthrough and, and sort of the, the lower level concepts of Sigma bullets and Zether smart contracts explained. Um, and then we have, um, where is IPFS hiding? Oh, right here. Uh, and then there's a sample for IPFS as well. So we've created a, um, we have a Kaleido samples gallery. Uh, where basically you just need some super high level information about a node endpoint and about some security credentials. Uh, and then you can experiment with these different services that we have. Uh, and I'd say tune in on a, an upcoming Tuesday. Uh, we're going to actually announce the schedule for, for the next month of, you know, cloud HSM, zero knowledge proofs, open ID integrations, all the different things you can do on Kaleido. So uh, we'll definitely do zero knowledge proofs again. That was a, it may have been the most popular one we've done so far. Um, but still very easy for you to create you know a token smart contract and you know go ahead and deploy a, a zero knowledge service and Kaleido experiment with it yourself cool so that was pretty much the full hour i didn't keep my promise of half an hour but uh, we'll, we'll get better going forward um, if there's any additional questions you guys are unmuted at the moment uh, if not i'm going to toss my email into the chat uh, and you can reach out to me with um, any questions, technical, commercial, um, basically, you know, if you want some, just want to brainstorm use case architecture um, or, or look a little deeper into your use case and solution, uh, happy to have that conversation and arrange a, a follow-up meeting. Um, I should also note that if you're using the product uh, inside of Kalatz, <laughs> inside of Kaleido, uh, excuse me, uh, there's a, there's a drop down. Uh, contact us button right here, an expandable window. So if you have a sales inquiry or you need product assistance or you think you found a bug, uh, you can just go ahead and send us a message and this is able to be seen by the entire support team and um, all of our all of our engineers. So a great way to get uh, a lot of eyeballs um, you know, on a, on a query. All right, well, that takes us to the top of the hour. Uh, I will thank everyone for attending and reiterate that I, I hope you're, sincerely hope you're staying safe and staying healthy. Um, and again, don't hesitate to reach out uh, directly to me or, or to the broader team uh, with any questions or concerns. Uh, so with that, we'll call it quits and uh, hope everyone has themselves a great Wednesday.